talked about folk culture or Volkish sort of culture before, and I'd like to talk about the English stroke Anglo Italian tradition of Punch and Judy. Now, I saw Punch and Judy first when I was about four years old, and almost everyone in Britain has seen it at some time or other. The first thing that strikes you about it is its colour and its vigour and its sort of moral stroke, amoral violence. If you remember, it used to be down at the seaside, pretty much, but it's now gone indoors as a sort of under-fives form of entertainment. Now, the man who does Punch and Judy is called a professor. And in working class or popular diction, it's widely known that anyone who's bright about a particular issue or could be said to be informed about it is called a professor. So anyone who talks with some degree of loquacity about anything, people say, you professor, mate. Yeah. And, that sort of thing. and that comes from Punch and Judy, the idea that the man who's in charge is the professor. And the professor is handed this role by a father figure or somebody before him. So it's an ancestral folk tradition. Traditionally, in this craft art, you have to carve the puppets yourself so that some of you enters into them as a thing, as a form. If you notice, in the tall booths, which have got this sort of red and yellow awning on front, back and uh, sides, the professor sits inside. So the professor's in quite a tall booth, which is open at the back so he can breathe easily on the seashore. And there's two hands that go up above the level that a youngish or childlike audience is looking up towards. And you've got the two figures. Now, there's a sort of occultistic and mystical element to Punch and Judy because Punch is always on the right of the professor. The left as people see it, but he's always on the right side of the professor because Punch can never be killed. Punch can never be destroyed. Punch is always eternal. Punch is a grotesque. He has an enormous nose and he has an enormous belly because he's been overeating. And he has an enormous hunchback. So already there's an element of sort of medieval or uh, quote-unquote cruelty to it because people laugh because he's deformed. So as soon as he gets up on the top of the stage, people go, ah, you know, and they're laughing at him as well as with him. His nemesis is Judy, of course, who comes up on the other side. Judy is a nag and comes from the Cama di Diate. She also has an enormous nose and sometimes an enormous belly as well. Sometimes their noses lock sort of horns like two beasts and they move about the front of the stage like this. At other times, she's more sedentary. The position of the left-handed puppets is changeable, because the left mutates and changes, politically, metapolitically, spiritually. It morphs. And the whole point of much of the killing, in inverted commas in Punch and Judy, is there has to be a mechanism to change the puppet on the left side all the time. So Punch beats them to death. They come up, ah! and they're beaten to death, and they go down again very quickly. And there's a whole range of these puppets that come up, of which Judy's the first. Now, all of these puppets are gloves, with the exception of the baby, because Punch and Judy are a couple, even though they're really old and decrepit, and they've had a baby. And the baby's on a stick with a small head, and it's the only one that sort of exists independently of the gloves. Traditionally, the baby is thrown into the audience in a particular scenario. Um, the audience is... 5 to 15 to 25 to 90. In the 19th century and early 20th century, there'd be enormous audiences. The children would be at the front, and the adults, engaging in a slightly guilty pleasure, would be at the back. Now, where does this tradition come from? The truth is, it's almost eternal, because these popular or folk forms that Richard Wagner and other major artists loved and built much of elements of their art out of are immemorial. There are pictures from Anatolia drawings that are a thousand years old and that depict figures in a booth that look suspiciously like a chap with a large nose and a funny hat beating a nag. So we sort of know that this tradition has existed in various ways and is reinvented. Those who are aware of puppets will know there are two forms. There's the glove that you can move like this and there's the marionette that moves from above with the strings. Everyone has seen Jerry Anderson's Captain Scarlet and Thunderbirds and Joe 90 and all of these sort of heroic things when they were very young, pretty much. And here we have the marionette that moves from above. That's very much the French tradition. There's a man called the Bottler who has a top hat and a large trumpet and he announces the festival. He announces the tragic comedy of Punch 
and Judy, although it's usually just the, the play of Mr. Punch. And all the children, the children drag the parents. You see, the parents go, oh, God, you know. But the children want to see it, so they drag them to the audience. The butler's so cool because he controls the crowd. Because it's a popular entertainment. It can be quite rough. If people don't like it, they chuck stuff at the stage. Stray dogs come round and have to be chased off <laughs> if you're outside. Punch and Judy traditionally involves a dog called Toby. Remember Toby Dog? Toby! And Toby's there, and he's on the top of the um, panel. Because he's very tame and so on. But he becomes a bit less domesticated when another mutt turns up, because he knows he's got to defend the pitch. That's one of his roles, you see. Now, this particular tradition that exists now, which has dipped down at various times, and is having quite a revival, paradoxically, in the last 25 years, when major concepts of Englishness have been under such deconstructive challenge, this tradition comes largely from the 1780s. An Italian showman who was believed to be illiterate and who settled in the East End of London brought an attenuated version of the Italian playlet called Commedia di Arte over the channel and settled here. His name was Piccini, but he was known as Porcini by all of his followers. Mr. Porcini and his travelling circus of freaks and shows. And he developed the modern tradition. Now, a man called A.P. Collier wrote a book about his type of theatre um, in about 1818, and a very famous English artist, Crookshank, did engravings of all of the characters. Now, Crookshank was a very major figure, equal to Hogarth and Rowlandson, and is one of the most violent and famous cartoonists and caricaturists in English traditional art. Um, the line and the concept of graphic energy in the line is cardinal to a particular type of Anglo-Saxon creativity. And one of the reasons that Puccini, amongst probably other showmen actually, is designated as the originator of the modern tradition, which is almost 250 years old now, is because an artist and a writer, Collier and Crookshank, put it down. Now, Punch is on the right here and can never be destroyed. Judy comes up. The baby also exists. There's a whole range of other characters. And the um, discourse is modulated as to how adult the audience is and how much they can take. One of the reasons that Judy and Punch nag each other is because he has a mistress. Yes, and the mistress is called Pretty Polly, and pre hence the term. And Pretty Polly appears occasionally. Polly never speaks, she just sighs. She just goes, ah, oh, 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 like this, and she moves about. And Punch moves around, circling like a shark, you know, with his nose down and the cat waving, and this sort of thing. <laughs> but Judy's always about to appear, like in the French fast, she's always about to appear. The nose appears on the side of the stage, and all the children go, ah, there she is, you know, and she's back again when Polly's disappeared, you see. What the Punchman is doing, what the Professor is doing, is every time a new character emerges, he, n he takes the glove down, he puts the glove on a hook, which is underneath the rim of the stage that the audience can see, and he brings up another character. One of the other characters is Clown Joey. And Clown Joey is a Zany, or a Zanni, in the sort of Italian version of the tradition, a Johnny. Joey is Punch's benevolent side, who can never be killed. He never speaks, but he's very irritating. He goes, <laughs> and Punch says, why are you doing that? What are you doing that for? You know, it's very, very irritating. I mean, consequently, he wants to beat Joey to death. And he, he attempts to get Joey in various ways. Joey dips down, Joey runs to one side. I'm going to get you, I'm going to get you. And they go back and forth across the top of the stage. He can never kill Joey because Joey is his benevolent side. Now, Punch is sort of non-dualist and amoral and attacks everything and everybody. And he's partly deaf because he's old and can't hear what people are saying. Another character is Scaramucci, or Scaramucci as he's called. Now Scaramucci comes up and is a differentiated version of Joey. He has a very long neck, very long neck, which you can extend out, out into the audience even. It's a trick of the puppet. You press a button inside it and it comes out. Or it's just a pole that you sort of lever out from the side and people think in the speed of it that it's coming from the puppet. And all the children go, oh, look, look, look. And of course, what Punch wants to do is break that neck or strangle him. So he tries to get over him and strangle him, of course. But he's indestructible, like Joey, his principal. Another famous character is the crocodile. The crocodile appears, and he's green, and has a very long sort of snout with teeth. And the crocodile is a relative of the dragon, which existed in the medieval mystery plays of the Middle Ages. The mystery plays usually involve a Christian icon, such as St. George, beating the dragon to death. 
the medieval idea being that the evil in the character, the puppet, is beaten out of the character. Now, often the crocodile can morph into a dragon, an older variant from the Middle Ages, which has largely been discarded from the contemporary troupe, or he can become the devil. The devil appears in Punch and Judy in red, with horns. And whenever the devil appears, the bottler, who's the sort of middleman between the audience and the stage, goes, whoa, look, the devil is here, and the devil comes up. And initially, Punch is frightened of the devil and runs about, because you can have sort of distended perspective, if you like. You can have one pun. Say I'm the um, professor. You've got Punch here. You've got the stage there. The devil emerges behind. It's sort of on your shoulder, really, you know? But you're down here, so your head can't be seen. And you move Punch across, and the devil comes up, and everyone goes, ooh, like this, you know? Um, traditionally, Dr. Johnson said in Boswell's um, autobiography uh, biography of him that Punch is always beating the devil to death, but he's always beating everyone to death including the minister. The minister or priest or Methodist, as he's sometimes called, is the sort of Christian figure who appears. His hands are glued together because he's so pious he's always playing, praying, you see. And he comes up and he's a dearly beloved, you know, we all love Punch. Punch is a sinner, we pray for his reclamation. And Punch says, shut up, you old fool! And beats him over the back of the head and he goes back down under the top of the stage. I first became very aware of the potency of this sort of tradition for people who are beyond five years of age when I attended an event of the British National Party, which is called the Red, White and Blue. And interestingly, they had a traditional punchman from Lancashire. And the police came on the site to stop him. This is very <laughs> interesting. The police came on the site to stop it. And the reason that they said they were going to stop it is it didn't have an entertainment license. And this is how things are done in modern Britain. There's a sort of ideological overlay to this, but these are just blokes obeying orders, and they say, you look, don't be boring, we've got this thing to enforce, obey us. We don't agree or disagree with it. We're merely functionaries, just a pair of hands, you know. And that's the view that they have of themselves, essentially. But in a way, if you look across England now, and Britain as an extension, an enormous number of our traditions, pubs, the circus, this sort of thing, is being disprivileged, yeah, is yeah, being yeah. put down. It's as if... It's not really wanted anymore. It's too er uh, or too organic or too ethnically charged. It's a dangerous absence of minorities in the audience. You know, it's slightly exclusionist by virtue of its program. Even though it hasn't really thought that, it hasn't set out with the idea of being incorrect or exclusionist. It just is because it relates to a prior period of identity. This brings me on to the very politically incorrect elements of Punch and Judy, beyond the quote-unquote sexism and the generalised beatings, you know, and the disabilism and animalism stroke speciesism and all the things which are just glossed. One element is the racial element. All foreigners are funny. So whenever a foreigner appears, people howl with laughter. The Turk appears saying Shalabar, everyone howls with laughter. The black man, as we'll call him, appears, and everyone howls with laughter. Immediately, Punch wants to kill him as soon as he appears, and leaps around, and this sort of thing. This tradition is called Jim Crow, which relates to a 19th century musical tradition made very famous by, um, by Jim Thompson, an Edinburgh artiste and sort of music hall performer, in around 1830. The whole tradition that morphs into human acting traditions and that gives rise to the black and white minstrels, which were very current on mass popular television at the time when I was a child in the 1970s, this all dips down because it becomes self-consciously offensive, in inverted commas. In a sense, when it becomes self-conscious, due to the presence of the other in its midst, it begins to realise it might be construed as offensive. Before then, it didn't even think it was offensive particularly, although some people would construe being beaten to death by a mallet as slightly offensive. <laughs> the other element, really. which is very current in Punch and Judy, but which is not often talked about, is the anti-Semitic element. Yes, it creeps in even in to Punch and Judy. Is that now, a big nose, is it? Uh, <laughs> that's, uh, that's an attenuated sublimation of the same thing. Uh, it's the presence of pork on the stage. Because, if you remember, they all have endless fights about pork sausages. And to, to, uh, in the modern sort of synthetic puppets, which people can get off uh, YouTube and um, the sort of internet auction houses like eBay and so on, they're made of stringy sort of polystyrene and they're purple. And they're always fighting. Joe loves the sausages. Joe, he wants the sausages. No, you're not having them! You know, and Punch fights with him over the sausages. The crocodile wants to eat the sausages. The dragon wants to eat the sausages. The padre 
wouldn't mind a few sausages. Get off! You know, and they're all fighting over this meat, essentially. But traditionally, real pork was used. So the punchman or professor had to handle pork. And this meant that it would be an indigenous tradition, what anyone said, because a way was found, almost not entirely consciously, to integrate into it elements which were not for outsiders. So this is how, in a sense, folk culture involves. It, it implicitly excludes those that it wants to exclude, essentially. And that's done quite deliberately, quite deliberately. And there are great routines about he wants to turn all the other characters into sausages, he develops a machine, and he puts it on the stage, and a policeman comes up, hello, you know, and um, what are you doing, you know, and he wants to turn Joe into a sausage, he wants to turn Scaramucci into a sausage, he wants to turn everyone else into a sausage, the crocodile comes up and wants to eat them. There's lots of sort of jiggery pokery with pans, because you cook the sausages in a pan, and all this, and somebody grabs the pan, and he belts them, and they go down again and come up behind, and if he kills one, he feels bad about it, but he doesn't really. I haven't got a conscience! And they all scream, you haven't got a conscience. And then he screams at the children, liars, liars! And this sort of thing, it's great fun. And then the skeleton comes up again, and this sort of thing, it doesn't speak, and the bottler says, whoa, the skeleton, the skeleton, there he is. And he goes down again to be replaced by the devil, and so on. Other characters include the hobby horse, the idea in popular diction that people ride hobby horses when they've got a particular enthusiasm or one form or another. Punch gets on this horse and rides, 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 rides to one side. And then he's a bit bored. He turns around and rides to the other side, you know. And then hobby horse disappears. Another character is the doctor. Doctors have been hated down the ages by everybody. And this is a chance for the audience to describe how they dislike the doctor. The doctor appears with a starch white collar and an enormous moustache. And he's bald and quite posh and snobby. And the doctor appears and he goes, Hello, my boy, ill again, ill again, you know. And the doctor is a complete quack who will be beaten by punch mercilessly. But of course, he's got a lotion called physic. What you need, my boy, is some physic. Physic is what you need because they're all being beaten up, you see. So what they need is some his snake oil, basically, because he's a snake oil salesman. And the doctor is always, Shut up, you quack! And he's always sort of beating him. Oh, oh, hitting a man of the cloth, hitting a man of the medical profession. And he goes down again and another one comes up. Now, there's always retribution for Punch's transgressive amoralism. And the retribution is in the form of the law and the state. And the policeman is one. Hello, 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 what have you been doing? You've thrown out your baby, you've thrown out your wife, you've beaten the crocodile to death, you're a reprobate, reprobate, you need to be hanged. And Punch is deaf, you see, because he's old. And he always says, I don't want to be fanged. No, hanged. Fanged. Uh, sprang. No, no, hanged, boy, you're going to be hanged. Do you understand? You're going to take some rope, says the policeman over here. And Punch says, I don't want any hope. I don't need any soap. No, he says, rope, rope. And the children are howling because of all of these lexicographical and, and grammatical and sort of verbal mistakes, which Punch knows full well, because he's dragging out the moment when he's going to be hanged. The traditional way in which he's going to be hanged involves a whole miscellany of characters, some of whom appear or not. Sometimes they're just melded into one. There's the hangman or the executioner who has a hood over his head. And he's often called Jack Ketch, who was a very famous executioner at the beginning of the 18th century. Indeed, when the body was thrown to him, people in the audience would say at Newgate, Catch that, me old son! You know, because Ketch is a catcher, you know? And when he, he often throws the baby to Ketch, saying, Get away with that, mate! You know, <laughs> he sort of gets hold of it and goes down at one end of the stage and then pops up again. Oh, I'm having you, boy! You know, and this sort of thing. The other figure of amusement, stroke contempt, stroke state power is the beadle. The beadle, who's a figure that sort of died out in English life. Traditionally a figure that imposes parishional law on behalf of a rather faceless man uh, magistrate in the neighbouring town. The beadle, or as Punch calls him, the black beetle, oh, don't call me that, don't call me that. Um, have you no respect for a man of the law? This is the beadle's view. The beadle directs the gibbet upon which Punch is going to be hanged for his many, many infractions, which are almost too numerous to mention, including beating the devil to death. But we'll come on to that a bit later. But there's great... That, that building the gibbet is very important, even though it's usually just a noose in the middle of the um, yellow and red stage. And sometimes the judge is involved, the beadle is involved, the hangman's involved, the policeman's involved, and they're all building it. Punch says, I don't understand how you are to be hanged. And he gets them to illustrate how you're going to be hanged, you see, which is how he traps them. So the Beatles, in a very famous 
world famous Punch and Judy skit, if you like, or performance within the drama, the Beatles says, Do you mean you've lived for several centuries and you don't know how to be hanged? And he said, That's right, I don't know, I haven't mastered the gift of it, the old son. You, you tell me, how are you hanged? He said, Well, it's only for illustrational purposes, and children, don't do this at stage, uh, at home, and the beer and the bottle shout, Get on with it, you old tart, you know. Because <laughs> you have all this interactive stuff, all this chat going on at the same time, and the noose is swinging and this sort of thing. And the Beatles says, well, what do you do, old man? Is you flex your neck. You need a flex neck for a good hanging. You know, you need to be in a certain state to be done in properly. Do you know what I mean? And then you put the rope round. Did you see what I'm doing? He says, do you see what you want to try? And Punch goes, ah, oh, that's very good, very good. I'll give it back to you now. And he puts it back on and he says, you see, you see, my neck is tensed. It's flexed appropriately. The rope's going up. Punch is going, ah, oh, yes, I see, I see. So you sort of know what's coming. And then the box comes out. Sometimes with somebody else, the box out. Even Pretty Polly or somebody, somebody sort of neutral in a way, in quotation marks, may come out and push the box out. And eventually it builds up and the three children are going absolutely berserk because they adore this sort of thing. Because it's so asocial and so unmediated and so impolite and so non-adult. And that's why they adore it, you see, because it's also an escapism as well. And they know full well what's coming. And the beetle steps on this box... Am I doing it correctly? Yes, yes, yes. Oh, yes, yes, you're doing it very well. You know, and this sort of thing. And eventually, of course, he says, No, it's your turn, boy. You're going to be hanged. You've, I mean, you're an utter reprobate. You've betrayed your wife. No, lies, lies. <laughs> you're throwing your baby out of, the, out of the window. Lies, lies, lies. You damn liar. And all this. Then you've beaten the law to death. Lies. And you've attacked a minister of the class. Lies. And this sort of thing. <laughs> And uh, I know you're going to pay. You're going to pay. And Punch comes up behind him and says, Like this! And he kicks the box away and the beetle's hanging like this. Oh, I'm hanged! I'm done in! I'm done in, my love! And he's dead, you see. And uh, Punch is racing around going, ah! <laughs> And he laughs for ages, you know, <laughs> in a chilling sort of a way. And says, <laughs> and says, You're dead! You're dead! And you're not red! You've got no cred! And you're really down in the fire! <laughs> and all the children are like this and the adults are getting slightly nervous you know um, because there is this element of pure power that's just they're just figurines you know that's coming out of the stage and then there's a sort of a resolution but there isn't now to get to those moments because Punch and Judy is an improvisatory show there are lots of gaps and so on often topical figures appear are introduced there was one show in Brighton with a well-known punchman, Byram, or one of the others who's well-known, where Saddam Hussein figured, where Osama bin Laden figured once, and that was said to be offensive, so that had to be changed. Because, of course, these are just figures against which whom you spit, you know, and throw potatoes and that mm. sort of thing, you know. They're just sort of mob, we're against them figures. Occasionally, Alex Ferguson's head will appear, you know, and people hiss and boo and throw stuff at it. You know, this sort of thing, because almost it's integrative. Anything can be introduced... Tony Blair was introduced and people were howling outrage, death to Blair and this sort of thing, you know, and the noose comes down and everyone cheers, you know and then it's replaced by somebody else um, uh, some of the most famous skits are the following, the thing begins and Punch comes on from the right side and hello hello boys and girls you know, it sort of begins quite slowly and then Judy appears, oh god hello, oh, hello, hello darling uh-huh. And she produces the baby. The baby appears in the middle of them as this stick. And Punch initially likes the baby. He goes, oh, so nice. Yes, lovely, lovely. And then the baby starts crying. Ah! Ah! And, that, and Punch goes, oh, shut up. Shut up! <laughs> and it gets worse. And she's going, soothe the baby. And he says, I'll take the baby. And he starts massaging the baby with his club around the head, going, ah, oh, chickory book. Oh, lovely baby, lovely baby. And the baby's going, ah, ah! And he goes, shut up! God, you're so ugly. He goes, <laughs> he says, did I really bear you? <laughs> of course, my sweet, she says from the side, you know. And in the end, the baby screams so much and becomes so angry and livid and this sort of thing, which is the punchman doing it from underneath where the puppets are, that punch gets transgressive. And he goes, he starts to indicate he's going to throw the baby into the audience. He goes, one, two, three, and people are going, no, don't do it, and others are going, go ahead, boy, you know, and, this, <laughs> and 
And the butler's going, now, now, is he going to throw it, children? Is he going to do it? Is he going to do it, my God? You know, and they'll go, yes, yes. And some go, no, no. And in the end, he throws it right into the uh, audience and that sort of thing. And Judy goes, oh, and almost collapses down because she's on this side. And the, the professor goes, whoop, and she goes down and punches there. And punch capers about like a madman. Goes, <laughs> no more trouble with that one, you know. And suddenly the skeleton appears, his conscience. And the butler goes, ooh, ooh, there he is. And he's there, but Punch can't see it, you see, because he hasn't got a conscience. And, and, and he, but he's worried by the presence of this, or numinous, the presence of this uh, force, this slightly metaphysical idea, his conscience, which he hasn't got. So he runs about trying to find your conscience, because if you've lost it, you need to find it, don't you? So he's trying to get it back. Where have you gone then, you know? And so <laughs> he sort of looks, and the devil, and then the skeleton can come down again to be replaced by Joey. And everyone loves Joey, you see, because it's Punch without any malevolence, which is why Punch can never destroy him. But he's very irritating, Joey, you know, he's always going, yeah, 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 and doing little experiments, you know, and this sort of little tricks. And Punch goes, God, you're so boring, I want to beat you to death! You know, <laughs> which is, you know, his response to a bad and tedious vaudeville term. And um, so Joey always escapes and always manages to get away and usually reappears with sausages, which Punch adores. And Punch goes, ah, sausages. And, and they, they follow each other round, and there's a sort of little bit of a hob that comes up, and he's put on the tray, because there's a sort of platform outside the basis of the stage. And Punch is looking over, and that sort of thing, and the, the sausages are sizzling, and the Prade comes along and says, you wouldn't give me one of those out of chist and charity, would you? And Punch says, no, and hits him in the head, and he disappears again. And then various other characters come up again, and appears because the crocodile is drawn by the sausages now whenever I, I have performed punch and judy with the puppets you know for children and adults and children of all ages and i always configure the crocodile with an ulster accent i don't know why <laughs> but i think he should have an ulster accent you know what i mean i want those wee porkers i want them i'm gonna wait bloody well have them you know what i mean hey yeah you know what i mean and he comes up like this and punches you Irish buffoon like this. <laughs> and tries to brain him basically, you know. And the crocodile goes, I'm not having any of that. Taking abuse from a wife backer is a step I can't tolerate. You know what I mean? <laughs> and he eats punch. He eats punch, he eats his head. The mouth comes round his neck and head and begins to drag him in. And Punch is sort of ticked up. Sometimes he actually comes out of the puppeteer's hand, which dispels the illusion. But the children have so bought in, and the adults as well, are so bought into the illusion by that time that these little sort of blips don't matter because the thing has become magical for them. And Punch is going, Ah, I'm dying, I'm dying! Like this, and he sort of dies in the crocodile's mouth. And the crocodile goes, Yeah, hey, I've done for him! Well, I said he couldn't be killed, but have we done it, you know? And this sort of thing. And then he takes the sausages and goes down, and the sausages trail along the front of the stage and then whip down. And then, of course, the doctor appears. Because when you're dead, you need a doctor, don't you? you know? And the doctor appears and says, Punch, punch me, boy. All right, Punch, you look a bit peaky, old man. You, know, you look a bit peaky. And Punch is going, I'm dead, I'm dead, I'm dead. And the doctor says, you don't look too dead to me, old man. You look, you look rather, rather all in. All in, you quack. He says, <laughs> come here, come here. And the doctor comes along because he wants to administer the physic. He says, what you need, punch is some physic. You need some physic, me boy. Physic, for rub it on your backside, rub it on your spine, rub it under your heart, run it under your throat, rub it over your brain. Physic in the morning, physic at tea, physic in the evening, physic for me. You know, and that sort of thing. And Funch says, shut up, you quack! And beats him, beats him almost to death, you know. And, they, and he disappears, and the minister comes up. And says, oh, Punch, Punch, you've had a near-death experience. Has this turned you towards the revelation? And he says, no, get off, get off, you quack! And he goes down, and the bishop, the minister always comes up and says, dearly beloved, let us sing for Punch, let us pray for Punch. And when we are finished, buy me a drink. <laughs> <laughs> and then he goes down again, you know. And then, of course, it's the beetle. Punch me, boy. Fighting with crocodiles, stealing sausages, throwing babies, beating your wife to death. But she's alive! She's alive! And then she reappears again. <sighs> you know. Judy? You know. Punch, what, what's happened to the baby? Nothing's happened to the baby. Is the crocodile eating the baby? No, no! Because what the punchman is doing is he's improvising on certain tropes, certain themes, certain set pieces... And he fits them together in various ways. But the way in which they occur 
rather like the way I sort of speak at these meetings, is not predetermined. So the logic is there, but the way in which it unfolds before you happens heuristically, it happens in the moment. So it's a sort of existential tradition, but they know where they're going. They know they have these particular set routines, particularly involving the big characters. The um, wife, Judy, the mistress, Polly. Polly comes up and uh, Punch leering over the stage like a dirty old man. You know, he comes right over the stage and goes, like this. <laughs> you know, <laughs> what a package. He says, what a dolly. What a Polly, eh? And she doesn't speak. Speak, me love. He says, speak words of endearment. <laughs> nothing to say because she hasn't she's mute you see so she's got nothing to say you know and he goes <laughs> and he's going around like this <laughs> this is usually slightly excised for the under fives you know but she's there and she's in some ways the motivation to the action because um you know what a lovey he says of polly what a lovey she's appeared and she's already in love with me and we've only just met and then nemesis judy appears and he goes oh god is judy and judy appears hello punch and she says, and he says, what do you want? And he says, don't be like that. She says, don't be like that. I've had a hard day. And he says, what do you mean hard day? I've been in the belly of a crocodile and up again. And you say you've had a hard day. Get a bit of this. And the club comes out and he wants to beat her to death. You know, and they run around and this sort of thing. And these performances go on for 20 minutes, 40 minutes, 45 minutes. The professors, well, you know, need a break afterwards because it's quite exhausting. But extraordinarily exhilarating because you give out such power and such energy. Um, often the closure of the piece is the devil. The, the devil comes again from the mystery plays and from medieval license, again as a figure of sort of nemesis, in part to inculcate the idea that Punch is partly heroic when he's actually transgressed against moral norms and against authority and is a showman and a shaman and a trickster and the number one card in the tarot and the one who's always out of step and the one whose cards sort of thrown on the table. Yet, He's the one who does for the devil. The devil rarely speaks. He's always red with sort of black sort of cloak, black sort of horn, sort of hook nose. He comes up and uh, the bottler does a lot with the devil. Ooh, here he is. Ooh, children, aren't you frightened? And the children go, yes. And a few brave ones go, no, no. You know, the devil, you know. And, so, and the devil's there and, and Punch is wary of the devil. And then they fall on each other. The devil sometimes has an axe and he has a club. And they're fighting each other. Don't forget, Punch is on the right side. The devil, spiritually, occultistically, is on the left side. Sinister. Sinister! There you see the devil. And they grapple with each other like this. And it gets very violent. It's been known in their excesses for Punchman to fall out and of the stage in front of everyone. And they gather it together again quickly and keep on. Because the old theatrical adage is, whatever happens, you keep going. You keep going. If one of the cast dies or has an hallucination, you keep going. There's a famous moment with Olivier at the National when some sort of slightly appeasing bloke falls off the stage and breaks his leg. Breaks his leg. Crack. And there's whole silence in the theatre. And the director says, get back on. Get back on. And he's made to crawl up back onto the stage. So it's sort of um, all forms of life have their courage, you see. This is the form it takes in that area. And... Punch and uh, the devil are fighting with each other, you know, like this. And the devil usually gets the better of Punch and hurls him to the ground and jumps up on top of him. Because he's got, say Punch is down here and the professor's hands inside him. And the devil gets on top of him and leaps on down. <laughs> you know, but doesn't say anything. Although the bottler provides the verbal sort of amphitheatre. And then Punch throws him off with a Herculean sort of burst that Dr. Johnson would have approved of. Johnson, when asked, said, the first... Uh, the first, uh, the first wig was the devil. And wig, of course, was a term for liberal in that era. And uh, eventually, Punch gets on top of the devil and beats him. Beats him very severely. Beats him down. Beats him down to the ground. The devil gets up again, throws him off. He's down on the stage. The devil down. He leaps on top of him. Punch gets more and more strong. The right seems to dominate the left more and more. The devil squirms and gets to the side. He drags him back. He gets on top of him, he beats him, he starts leaping and whooping and that sort of thing. And eventually the devil dies and expires. And the bottle comes out from around the back and goes, Children, lords and ladies, mums and dads, the devil is dead, the devil is dead, and the man is done it, I give it to you, he's Mr. Punch. And he takes a bow for killing the devil. He goes, thank you, thank you very much, thank you. You know, <laughs> mine's a fiver. <laughs> <You know? laughs> and the devil's lying there. 
And there's this amazing moment which for many years the church used to try and ban these performances because they're often performed outside mass. They're often performed outside in the churchyard, um, sort of. And they try and move it onto secular ground, if you like. And also too many people would come in directly out of church and watching it, this rival and or other entertainment. And he leaps on top of the devil and screams, The devil is dead! The devil is dead! The devil is dead! And now you're free to do what you want! Which is quite a sort of transgressive idea, of course. You know, this is an under five audience, you know? And then he dips down. And usually, there's a side interlude bit of music, the bottler gets the trumpet out, which of course is a way, is a grammar, is a punctuation device, is a way of slowing the action, because of course you build people up and then you let them go and then you build them up again. Then you usually go to the sequences with the gibbet, which is the attempt at closure. And then after it's all over, of course, the um, curtains on the front of the stage go across, because it's just on a switch, just little curtains, and you just whip them across. Um, smaller versions of the red and yellow awnings that go from the top to the bottom. And there's enormous applause because usually if the, if the punchman's any good, if the professor can do it, you can hold children because of the ferocity and the primal nature of it. It's designed at every moment never to be boring. Do you see what I mean? Because what you do is it's sort of it's a pure cardinal type of performance because it's not intellectual at all. It's completely unmediated. It goes, the energy comes straight out of the performer. It comes into the audience. He rips it back again. They give a lot of energy that he also recycles to them. It's pure theatre. The people who see it when they're very young, particularly the very violent dolls, you know, the very Victorian ones with heavy paper mache heads. So every time punch hits them or brains them, you hear the bang, you hear the clunk, 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 like this and this sort of thing. Whoa, whoa, whoa. You know, and that sort of thing. It's quite physical, quite animalian, um, also slightly animist. I know there was a famous northern punchman from Bolton who would never allow his characters to be hanged. And when somebody said, why? He said, because they're alive. And there is this streak in all of these performance thing-related arts, ventriloquism is the most famous, where they do take on a life of their own. I knew a ventriloquist, and the, venture, and the doll would be in the corner of the room, and the doll would have grey skin, and these big red rubbery lips. The doll was completely hideous and had long nails like this and had a sort of point or all suit, you know, with a bow tie and a striped waistcoat and that sort of thing. And the doll is the unconscious of the performer or semi-consciousness of the performer. So you'd say, hello, Robert. And he'd say, oh, God, that bastard's turned up. And he'd say, shut up, shut up. Because the, uh, the negative side, the anima, in Jungian terms, would come out of the doll, you see. He doesn't like you, you know, said the doll. And the ventriloquist says, shut up, shut up. He's such a bad boy, such a bad boy. You know, because the negative element of the personality comes out of the doll. There's a very famous scatological female ventriloquist, and she insults men in the audience. God, look at him, says the doll. And that sort of thing. <laughs> and these blokes in these working men's clubs, they come out and they punch the doll. They punch the doll all that, you know, because the doll has insulted them. Because it's alive, you see. It's non-dualist. It's the bit that people don't say to avoid social conflict comes out through the doll. And so there's always an aggressive sort of tiger in the room element in all of these forms of popular culture, if you like, because they're interactive, they have a dangerous side. There's no bully, as it were, because in Garrick's day, in the 18th century, every theatre had a bully. You had men at the corner of the stage with clubs, because when, traditionally, women couldn't be put on the stage, because the audience would howl, prostitute, and this sort of thing. Only at the end of the 19th century, with Ellen Terry, did it really become respectable for a woman to be on the stage. Many men, would get, if they saw a woman on the stage, they would immediately think she was available. So they'd get on the stage and leap towards her. And Garrick would whistle, and a bully would come out of the wings and get hold of the reprobate, flog him, and drag him out into the Strand or drag him out into Charing Cross Road, where the Garrick Theatre now is, and <coughs> throw them in the dirt. You know, and Mrs. Zafrelli or whoever it was would rearrange her bodice and continue the performance, you know. And they're always a trooper, you see. And, you know, it just has to keep going. And that type of energy... Uh, which is dimmed by television, dimmed by the collapse of vaudeville in our culture in the 1950s. How many of you have seen The Entertainer by John Osborne with Olivier? When at the end, there's only three old dears at the back of the audience, musicals dying in the 50s, and uh, Olivier says, I'm dead, you know, loves. Dead behind my eyes, he says. He's painted up like a clown and so on. Dead, dead. <laughs> And one of the old dears at the back says, God, this isn't much fun, is it? You know? 
And, uh, but Punch and Judy is a lot more fun and a lot more grotesque and uh, quite dangerous actually. And the endless, endless prohibitions that have been put on it, church prohibitions, liberal state and materialist prohibitions, entertainment license provisions, you don't see it very much at the uh, seaside now, but it's sort of been morphed and resurrected as a cardinal folk tradition, usually with the racial and pork sausage element sort of played down, the sexual dimension with the mistress, Polly, of course, played down, but still, that cardinal element. The modernist... Um, composer Harrison Bertrassel wrote an opera called Punch and Judy and Stephen Cruslin wrote the libretto and it was his first piece and it's a very violent sort of um, expressionistic piece in many ways most of the traditional punchmen don't l like um, Gwyn, Ed Gwyn Edwards and Michael Byram and George Spate who wrote the cultural history of Punch and Judy came out about 35 years ago and certain other Jeff Felix He's a well-known punchman and wrote a book of recollections which consisted of them all talking about their lives and this sort of thing. Because many of them had fascinating lives. Traditionally, they would just go about in a cart. They had no home. The home was the next tent. The home was the next performance. They lived on what they got, in the bottle. Traditionally, they're called bottlers because you go around with a bottle at the end and people put coins in it. I bought some money for the showman, Gil. Some money for your man. The money for the performer. And everyone had just put in some coins and that sort of thing. And at the end of it, they were talking about sort of pre-modern money, of course, that it would be filled to the lip and you would smash the bottle in front of the audience and all the coins would go all over, but you'd have the bottle to get them up quickly again because that's what you needed to live on until the next performance, you see. Now, that won't work because you can't live on 320 a week, you know, which is what coppers filling a bottle would yeah. amount to. But people throw fibres and so on. And what they do now is it's in children's parties. Where in a way the tradition is castrated and slightly emasculated because it's too twee, it's too polite, it's too unutterably nice, and it's too small. The sort of the average living room, the energy that's created by this very macabre theatre, really, is too small. But I personally think that Country and Judy is an extraordinary example of the folk tradition, and it always makes me smile that you have major cultural Marxists like Theodore Adorno who wrote an enormous 800-page book in the middle of the 20th century called Aesthetic Theory, um, which is the basis of quite a lot of ideas about contemporary culture. And they dislike the cultural industry. They dislike the culture that provides, the industry that provides Madonna and uh, Michael Jackson as the colophons, as the things, the icons which you are drawn to adore, you know, the Amy Winehouse types, you know? Mm -hmm. He dislikes all of that, you know. And, um, and yet... If you follow through the logic of what Adorno is saying, one of his criticisms must be that it's transplanted these folkish forms, that it's transplanted these organic forms, that it's pushed them to the side. But in all truth, he wouldn't like many of these organic forms in their fauna and flora and in their violence and their morality, in their texture of lividness, in their Greek tragedy without necessarily the high words and concepts, because it's called a tragic comedy of Punch and Judy. And the best theatres the very large 19th century ones, which were very elaborate, had the figure of the attic figures of tragedy, misery, you know, and comedy, humour. Because one moment he's crying, oh God, and the next minute he's beating them to death, you know, and enjoying himself, in other words, you know, or leaping on the devil, you know, wouldn't you like to leap on the devil? You know? Um, it's this idea, you see, and it goes from comedy to tragedy to tragic comedy to burlesque to sentimentality and back again. Because popular culture like this really has two nodal points, uh, sort of aggression and sentimentality in a way. But the speed with which they interchange with each other can be quite profound and quite sort of liberating for an audience. It often exhausts an audience. The audience is often exhausted at the end of it. They've been to a rally. They've been to the equivalent of a political rally and yet received no ideology. That's the trick of that type of performance. And although it's a distant point, you can say that politicians and people who attempt to influence society, I mean, no academic would give a performance like that, would they? It's contraindicated. You can't do it because you, it's a sort of carnal type of culture where you're actually, it's a physiological performance. The words are largely noises, which is why Punch is always making noises, you know. <laughs> You know, all the time, you know, along with the general thing. One point I haven't made is that the punchman has a device in his mouth called a swazzle, through which he creates this sound. 
Now, you can create it without that, of course, but the tradition is you have this thing in your mouth. This is quite difficult because you have to have it on a chain or a bit of rope because when the swizzle's in your mouth, you're doing punch. Hello, hello, hello. You know, whack. You know, ha, <laughs> ha. <laughs> that sort of thing. But when another character comes on, you've got to spit the swazzle out and do them more normally. Like the policeman, boy, you're up to me, boy. You know, and this sort of thing. So, I think there is, a there is a parallel to be drawn between certain types of extremist political speaking and these types of performances. Because that type of speaking, which is now completely disprivileged in current political discourse involves speaking to the whole audience. It involves speaking to the front of the brain, the back of the brain. It involves speaking intellectually, but also cardinally, also semi-carnally. It involves taking energy from the audience and giving it back. It's partly a theatrical performance, as well as an ideological and semi-intellectual one. It's deeply disprivileged now. Hardly any politician can do it. The type of performance that is permitted now is Obama's where Obama has a device here and a device there, and he looks at the one and he looks at the other, and he says, Today, in America, we are born for the greatness which is coming. <laughs> and he gives a very big grin, because the teleprompter gives the words, and it's all in about 20 or 18 points. You know, the size of it is enormous. Indeed, Bush was so thick. Bush, too. That the teleprompters would often have false words because he might get confused if they were properly spelled <laughs> so he had to have these false words like desert would be desert or something just to get his mouth around it you know because it needed to be phonetic so he would grasp it so he wouldn't say gee what's that you know in the middle of it with the whole media watching him you know these terrorists that we need to punish you know it's like Jerry Adams Gaelic have you ever heard Jerry Adams speak Gaelic uh, which is a, his political use of language. He speaks Gaelic like this. John, chop, on, the mat. It's like that. It's just for effect. It's, you know, John said, on, John said on the mat. You know, it's a political use of language because if you speak too aggressively, too unselfconsciously, too much with a theatrical flow, it's regarded as fascistic. I remember David Owens once, and David Owens is a very poor speaker, you know, sort of paint-drying sort of a chap, but he always used to address his Social Democratic Party, that tiny little party that split away even from the SDLP, if you remember all that bother, about 20 years ago. He used to address them in a slightly authoritarian way. He'd be in black, they'd be down there, he'd be up there, and people talked about the new Caesarism, you know, I mean, David Owen, you know. But even something like that, which was not trying to befriend the audience, which was not feeling the audience's pain, which is the Blair and Clinton thing, you know, I feel your pain. Do you? I feel your pain. You know, you're reaching out into the audience. You know, these sort of a lie, which of course it's a lie. It's a sort of therapeutic discourse rather than a militaristic one. Do you think Julius Caesar in front of the legions would have spoken like that? Oh, Christ. Do you think Napoleon would have spoken like that? Do you think even Gr Ulysses S. Grant, if you like, you know, would have spoken like that? Or leaders on the Confederate side? Do you think Montgomery could have addressed the Eighth Army like this? You know, reach out to the tankman and say, I feel your pain, you know, and all this. You know, and when you realise that the discourse shapes the nature of the society and shapes the nature of the minds of the people in the society, if you say to you, I'm sorry, you know, you're going to get old, you're going to die, and this sort of thing, I'm so, so, so sorry. What sort of a society will you have if this isn't your last word, but your first? Your first word. When you go to a mass audience, the important thing about public speaking is never to be afraid. The second important thing is never to give a damn. And that means you can just get up in front of people. The third thing, which is an old actor's technique, is you must never be frightened of making a fool of yourself. In actor's college, you go on and they all laugh at you and they think, look at that idiot, you know. And they almost throw things at you and you're, you're, you're sort of, imagine breaking your leg on stage and all this. Because once you've made a mistake, you're less afraid about making another one because you just step over the prospect that you might make one. Another trick to all real performance is domination of the audience. You have to be up there and they're looking at you. And all rock stars and all these other people who use some of these techniques because they've gone into those areas, you see, they're not allowed militarily too much. They're not allowed at all politically because they're mentally authoritarian. So they've gone into other areas. You can never destroy anything. You can just displace it, usually to some internet site you haven't taken down yet. But there is a degree to which 
These sorts of techniques are very, very useful, particularly in a democratic age, because you can speak to 40 and speak to 3 million using the internet as the weapon to do so. And the irony is, you see, in politics, you don't speak to people's minds. You speak to them physiologically. You speak to what's underneath the mind. Do you think you can raise men up into battle uh, just by talking to the, what's mentally up here? You influence the brains of the men who will influence your discourse to influence them by doing that. But you don't influence them by doing that. Tony Blair once said that we went to war in the past, between 1914 and 1918, and 1940 and 45, and all the other wars, to fight for tolerance. To fight for inclusion, he said. Inclusion and tolerance. Can you imagine giving your troops a bit of tolerance and inclusion before they went over the top? Of course not. You give them something quite different. Quite different. Almost probably unrepeatable in a way. And probably the men at the back couldn't quite hear what the bloke was saying anyway. But they understood what it meant. You see, real speaking, they understand what you mean even if they don't understand what you say. Because it is the way in which you say it and it's the energy that goes into certain subconscious parts of the brain. Of course, there was a man who came earlier in the 20th century who had a very considerable talent for this type of speaking. <laughs> and it was regarded as very dangerous. But all sorts of other people have had that talent, which is inborn. Um, it can be trained, you can make people better, but in the end, it's inborn. And it's a way in which you can mobilise very large numbers of people. The question is, for what? And why will they follow? A critic would put his hand up and say, what you're saying is all very well, but why would they follow your discourse rather than another? And my view is this. If you speak, as in these puppeteering performances, from a position which is primal, from a position which is organic, from a position that comes out of the ground and relates to the corpses and genealogies of that which was before you. You can make mistakes, you can abstract things, you can go onto different paths, but the audience understands where you are coming from because they hear the echoes of the voices that have spoken before you. And that is why they respond in that physical way. Newton was why, Newton, the, the scientist, was an incredibly arrogant, slightly sociopathic and quite unpleasant man, but he was once asked, how did you come across the second law of thermodynamics? Newton in physics discovered the idea that energy in a system always replaces itself when it's used. Now, Newton said something very interesting. For a man who was so full of himself and so full of hubris, as the Greeks would have said, he said, I saw further than the others because I stood on the shoulders of giants. And that is why you can influence an audience because they know what existed before you and you are basically plugging in. You are putting the plug in the socket and you are turning the switch down. Nietzsche, in one of his books, it's in Will to Power and in others, the notebooks collected after his death by his sister, says, not me, not me, but the wind that flows through me. And it's the idea that when you're in such a mode, certain things flow through you from the past, from what is rooted, from what is underneath you, and can affect people can liberate the wrong word, but can free elements of their mind that are otherwise constricted, that can get them to see the truth about life. And that's why there's this odd interconnection between high and low forms of culture, because the high intellectualizes the primal energy of the low. As soon as you begin to theorize or philosophize about the motivation of the characters, even though they're made of wood and paper mache, you immediately have tragedy. Because if you begin to understand the motivations of the method of destruction, you're immediately uh, dealing with the questions of Aeschylus's Oresteia. You leap from the very low, if it's organic and rooted, to the very high and can go back again. This is why liberal society is sort of cancerous, ultimately, of real culture, because it divides the interconnectedness between the high and the low and prevents the energy coming up from beneath, from the bottom to the top. A real culture has everyone involved in the culture, not watching the idiocy of Ferguson's latest team of foreign imports, but understanding the nature of their own culture from top to bottom. In Shakespeare's day, the whole society was in the theatre. The lower class, the middling class, the upper class, they were all there. All the soul fights and the extreme switches of scenery and the, 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 the instantaneous scenes that suddenly they're full of language but they shift and they're very quick. That's to keep it going so people won't get bored. Um, 
the jester, the fooling Leo, you know, uh, sort of give your give me your hand. Ooh, no, I don't know where it's been, you know, that sort of thing. <laughs> if they were bored, they got tomatoes. Yes. yes, and if they were bored, they would throw fruit and nuts out of the pit, the pit, at the actors, and they realised they had to sort of speed things up. So Henry Irving in the 19th century was very funny. Whether Henry Irving and David Irving are at all related, I've got no idea. But Henry Irving is the greatest actor of late Victorian England, always played monsters always played Mephistopheles, uh, always played these sorts of characters. But when he forgot the lines, he would make it up. Because he was such a so-and-so. If he was on the heath doing Leo, you know, sort of, you know, um, Ho, bloody beadle, why dost thou whip that whore? Thou lastest to use her for that kind for which thou whipst her. You know, which is a couple of stan a stanza from Leah. And you can't remember the next bit. He'll just go, And as the owls do breach the lofty turns of this tree a storm, which he's just made up, you know, <laughs> because, it's, because you've got to have that sort of facility to continue it. And there's somebody in the wings desperately sort of trying to get a message across to you as to what you should be saying, which, of course, is why the wings are there. Because when you forget your part, the blame's got to go, no, no, you know, and try and give you a bit of it. And... Um, but the theatrical dimension, the excitement, think how exciting those political meetings would have been before television. Think how enervating and energising they would be. After one of those sorts of meetings, you'd want to take your entire society over, wouldn't you? Rather than just go back and watch the X Factor on the box. Do you know what I mean? You would, what, you would, you would feel invigorated and empowered, wouldn't you? Yeah. And that's the purpose of these. They're almost like secular religious events. And that's what these forms of culture are. And that is why they're not liked. And that is why they're slightly disprivileged. And that is why they are scorned. Because if you want to win in a battle in a court, you don't speak in this way. But if you wish to take a society back, you take some cognizance of these traditional forms. Thank you very much.